Welcome, everybody, to a, another round of Warriors 24. I'm your host, Rick Berry, along with my psychic, Starrett Satchis, the surf man himself, who I still have yet to get my son Brent to be a guest on his show that he does for surfing. But we are delighted to, uh, to be joined. On this tele on this broadcast, actually, with uh, one of the one of the great guards in the history of the Golden State Warriors, and one of the top guards actually who's ever played professional basketball, that's Tim Hardaway is joining us. Tim, he's back in his hometown there, and uh, and out back in Michigan. And Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it, man. No, this is not my hometown. I'm from Chicago, Rick. We just said that. No, it's in Michigan. You're in your hometown in Michigan. I mean, that's, well, yeah, I live here. Yeah, I live here in Michigan. Yes. In Michigan, your home state, I should have said, probably right. more more correct. But anyway, of course, he was the famous member of of, of Run TMC, which only lasted, I think, for a couple of seasons or so. That's which right. was really fun, fun to watch. It had been a long drought for the Warriors after I left to go to Houston. It went like thirteen years before uh, Timmy came along with uh, with his cohorts, Mitch and and Chris, to uh, to finally get back into the playoffs. And the fans were very loyal there, though. Wasn't it pretty amazing how, how the fans stuck by this team for so many years? And they finally, you know, got rewarded with you guys. Then they went into another drought again, and they got rewarded again. What was it like with the fans there for you guys? Man, you know, I always say this. Though the fans in the Bay Area are the most loyal fans, and I think – professional sports history. We talking about the Oakland A's, we talking about the Oakland Raiders, talking about the Golden State Warriors, man. Um, and they'll tell you, they'll tell you if you're dogging it too. Don't don't think they don't know about basketball. They know ins and out about the game. They very studious to the game. And um, you know, if you're out there dogging it, they will let you know that. You know, I pay you my money to come see you all play because I'm a fan and here you are out here dogging it. And, uh, they, you know, they, they, they be pissed off about that. So um, they the most loyal fans, I think, in sports history. Well, I think wow. one of the reasons why they're that way, uh, <clears throat> Timmy, is that I have a lot of transplanted East Coasters and the East Coast people really know their game of basketball. And they talk about how hard it is when you go to play in the garden and play against the Knicks and all, but they had a lot of New Yorkers back there. And uh, cause I know when we played, I don't know how it was for you guys, when you played against the Knicks, there were a lot of Knickerbocker fans in the stands. I think there's a lot of Knickerbocker fans in every stand that you go to across the NBA, just not in Oakland. I just think they, they <laughs> are in Phoenix, they in LA, you know, and they're loud and obnoxious too, but you know what? Uh, the, the Knicks fans love their Knicks. And, you know, they, they think that they are the uh, basketball or the sports capital of the world. And, you know, uh, you know it's, I know it's one of the greatest cities in the world to go visit. Uh, but, you know, uh, that's the way they are, man. They love, they love basketball and they love their sports, no question about it. I was wondering when you went back to New York to play, if you had the same thing happen to you that happened to me ages ago. And I go, Rick, how you feeling? How you doing? Cause see, I found out later that these guys bet on everything. They're like betting on how many points are scored yeah. in the first yeah. quarter and the second quarter. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. You know, you, you, you find out that, that that's what they're doing. You know, you, you, you don't figure it out until, you know, probably the 10th or the 12th or the 20th person asks you that same question. But, um, you know, if, when you're there in the city, you're going to eat somewhere, um, you're just walking around, and if they know you and they know you're playing at night, they do ask you those, those questions like, how you feeling? You know, what's the team up to? Is there any injuries or, you know, um, how so-and-so, you know, feeling? I heard he was out last game. Is he going to play this game? So, yeah, you, 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 you kind of if, – if you understand the game and you understand your craft – when you're there, you, you, you pick up on a few things, and, that, and I picked up on that real quick myself. And I, and I, and I was real quick to, like, uh, say, I don't know. You know, we'll see. You know, yeah. you <laughs> might wait game time. Here is my answer. My answer to him is say, hey, it's not how I feel. It's how I play that counts. Because I've felt good and played lousy, and True. I felt lousy and played good. I mean, <laughs> what about you? What kind of scenario did you have? I know it didn't matter how I felt before the game. You know what? It doesn't matter how you feel be before the game. You're absolutely right because if you feel great, you come out and play lousy. And if you feel lousy, you come out and play great. You know, prime example, I, I, you know, I say, you know, Michael Jordan's, one of his best games was the flu game in Utah. He came out and had a hell of a game. 
Uh, you know, even though it was Michael Jordan, but you know, he he was supposed to, he wasn't supposed to even be there. Most teams tell you go home. No, you're not gonna play. You you're gonna um, uh, make everybody sick on the court, and then you know if we lose, then we're not gonna have nobody else play for the next game. But you know that was one of his signature games when he went out there and won with the flu. And and Scottie Pippen had to literally help him to the court and off the court doing timeouts. And um, so you know you're right about that. You know you you never know. You you think you're feeling good and say, oh man, I'm gonna come out here. And, I mean, I'm gonna have a great game. I'm gonna have about 40, 45 points. You end up shooting two for 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Tim, you, you know, you played during the era of Jordan. I mean, I, I think your playing careers were almost side by side. You started a few years after him, but you're, this documentary has captivated the whole country. We're all on lockdown right now, and this is amazing t- television. Describe your reaction to the show so far. I mean, again, this was your era. Love it. I love the show. Um, I think they're doing a beautiful job. I think he's doing a beautiful job of how he's, you know, is um, talking about how he wanted to win and where it came from. Um, I'm going to tell you this. I I was in high school, my last year in high school, when he got drafted by the Bulls. And when he got drafted by the Bulls, it was sellouts only. Before the Bulls, before Michael Jordan, I could walk in the arena, sit anywhere, um, and, and nobody bothered me. But as soon as he got drafted, all the tickets were sold out. And I remember his first game against Washington Bullets. You know, Jeff Ruland, he went down the lane. He was going to dunk on Jeff, um, uh, on, uh, Jeff Ruland, and Jeff Ruland put him on his back. And he, they had to carry him to the – not carry him, but, you know, help him to the locker room. And he came back to show that, you know, he's not a soft guy and I'm going to come back and play and, and play very well. And, he, you know, and that's when the team – started getting their toughness and started getting there, you know, that, that Michael Jordan was for real. But, yeah, you know, through the, through the Detroit Pistons era, you know, that's where he really truly made his mark. You know, he, he didn't say a word. He didn't cry. He didn't talk bad about him. He didn't talk, say, like, you know, I'm getting fouled all the time. He, didn't, he, he just shut up and took everything that they gave him and that's what made him strong, and that's what made him better as a player and more competitive as a player and one to win every time he stepped out on the court. So when, when, he, when, when he's talking about that era and, and, and what made him, that's what made him. And I, and I personally think without him going through what he went through with the Detroit Pistons and how they treated him uh, with the Jordan rules, I don't think that he would – have been, you know, that Michael Jordan um, after that. He was pretty special. There's no question about it. The thing about it is I think that he probably had a similar mindset to mine. It was okay. You know, I actually, they did a lot of dirty stuff. In fact, watching that, watching, (laughs) watching the, you know, watching some of the video in, you know, in the, in the documentary, it was embarrassing to to me, to the league, that they allowed that crap to go on because it wasn't even basketball. I always tell people, Timmy, it doesn't take one bit of talent, skill, or ability to play that way. Anybody can do that. You don't have to be a basketball player with skill to play that kind of physical game. Well, you know, I, and you're absolutely right, but I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, Rick. You get away with what you can get away with. Oh, yeah. And- and, and they got away with it. And the it's league the let, them let them do it. it. The league let them get away with it. And then it didn't only go from, you know, the Detroit Pistons and playing against everybody like that. It went to the New York Knicks. When Pat Rowley went to the New York Knicks, it was mm-hmm. like that too. And then when I went to Miami, we was playing like that too. So but we, <laughs> we wasn't, you know, you know, like he comes in the lane and, and, and you know, and push people and, and, and shove people and, you know, try to hurt them before they get up. We wasn't like that to that extreme. But, you know, they, they was letting them get away with that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think at one particular time, David Stern was like, hey, you know, um, I think we need to start protecting this guy. <laughs> that's, our, that's, that's our money guy here. I think we, we, get, we got to start protecting him a little bit better than what we're doing because those guys are on their way out. This guy is on his way up, and that team is on his way up. And, uh, you know, I, that's the way it was. But, uh, yeah, you, you know, you, you, I, I got there 
after that, Rick. So you was there before that. So you would know better than I would how, uh, uh, as you would say, a shame as you were, as how they was playing. Uh, but, uh, you know, but when we was growing up, we was liking that type of basketball. <laughs> well, first, of all, first of all, when we played, every team played that way when I first played. I mean, it was rough and tough. And like I joke around, people I said, if I played today with, with the way it is, then you can hardly sometimes even breathe on a guy. I mean, I should be shoot 15 to 20 free throws a game, for God's sake. You can't even hardly breathe hard on a guy anymore. <laughs> That's true. That is true. That is true. Seriously. Oh, that's amazing. You know, you two. You know, one last thing, Cyrus. No, no, go, go. I I'm just sorry. went to finish this train of thought that we're going along here. My thing is, and I got back to what I had said originally, I never did answer saying why the mindset. My mindset was, like, I don't give a crap. If, if I can get up after you knock me down and I'm getting free throws, keep hitting me. Yeah, exactly. Because they free, <laughs> they free free throws and you give me free points. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Oh, that's amazing. You know, I, I was going to start, I sorry to interrupt you there, Rick. I just, um, I, I'm in this unique setting from my perspective of having two of the most legendary players ever. And you both play for the Warriors, which adds to this, but you're also in a very unique circumstance in that you two have children who are, or were NBA players, right? right. But your circumstances are especially unique because, and this is no slight towards your kids whatsoever, but you two were so good that your children ultimately to a certain extent played in your shadows. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. I mean, like, like do, do you have to remind your kids, look, who cares what I did? Or do you even talk about it? And what, what do you think it's like for them? Well, I, I told my son as he was um, coming up, I said, you know, the quicker you can um, say, tell folks, forget my dad, it's over with for him, it's me now. That, that you know, that, that is the best way to get it out your mind also and to think that way. Uh, because it, it's not about your dad. It's not about me. It's about him. And it's about etching his name in stone and trying to create his own image and his own game. And, you know, Rick, 6'7", six, 6'6". Six, six. I'm six feet. My son's 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, so you can never compare me and my son together because, you know, I, I'm a little guy. He's a little, he's a taller guy. And he got a better stroke than I do. And I got better handles than I, than he does because I was a point guard. And you know what? We grew up differently. You know, I grew up in an era where, you know, uh, uh, you know, beating each other up, physicalness, uh, you know, talking bad about you, talking a lot of smack. And my, my son grew up, Hey, how you doing? You know, let me help you up, pat you on the back. All right, we're going to shake hands at the end of the game, you know, and all that type of stuff. So it's two different, way two different eras. But, you know, you got you to gotta create your own style. You got to go out there and feel com com comfortable and confident about your own style and your own play. And you have to learn on your own, too. I, I mean, you ask me questions. I want to help them out, but – it, I, I'd rather him ask me questions. I just don't want to be pushing it on him because that, that'll bag him up and that'll shy him away from me because he think I'm taking control. I don't want to take, take control. You are in control of your own life. You're in control of your own basketball career and you're in control of this, what you do on the court. But when you have a question, don't hesitate to ask me so I can help you and make it better for you. Excellent advice that you gave him. Seriously. I mean, that's the whole thing is that the last thing the boys wanted to hear is getting a million questions and telling them. So I got to the point, fine. Do you, do you want to hear what I thought about the game? And, and if you don't want to hear, great. If you want to hear my thoughts, I'll be happy to give them to you. You can, but the bottom line is, is that people have to understand, and this is for all parents out there. And I tell the, the, <laughs> the ones who are finally having their first kids, I said, look, I just want to tell you something. Just be prepared. For this. <laughs> you don't realize this, but in the years ahead, you are going to become one of the dumbest people on the face of the earth. You don't realize that yet, but your child is going to think that you don't know anything. And then all of a sudden, when they get older, you get smart again. It's really amazing the transition that takes place as a parent. Do you, you agree, would you agree with that, Tim? I agree with that right now because my son and my oldest daughter went through that. And now they, they, they ask me advice all the time. I have an 18-year-old that's going through this same thing that you just said right now that I don't know nothing. She said, oh, you know, you don't, you don't know nothing. You, you, that, that was then, Dad. This is now. And so 
and, and my, my, my son and, and I mean, his, her brother and sister be telling her, okay, wait until you get, you know, to college when you, you know, two or three years, cause she graduated this year, you know, wait until you get 19, 20 and in college and everything, you're going to be calling dad, asking dad <laughs> for his advice. It, it, it sure, it sure is going to come, but you know what? I just let her go ahead and just think that she knows everything about everything. Because you're right, Rick. It's gonna come back around, and she's gonna ask me questions like, "Okay, Dad, I need you. What's going? You know, what about this?" Well, well, that's amazing. I, it's it, well, it's it's interesting. I mean, just you know, having kids in general changes your life. I mean, entirely. But I mean, I just curious as to how you felt. I can't even express adequately. There's a few times in life that you have something happen to you where words become inadequate to really express how you feel about something kind of like when I was watching some of my kids being born. I mean, I, I mean, I can't express just how incredible that was to me, okay. but the same thing watching my boys play basketball, I can't even express adequately the, the joy that I get of watching them play, even though you're living and dying with everything they do, you want them to do everything perfectly. How do you feel about, you know, when you're watching your son out there playing? I'm the exactly the same way. I'm um, on pins and needles. I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm like, you know, every move that he makes, I'm making, you know, I'm in a stance, you know, but when somebody asks me that question, I tell them, you, I can't really tell you how good it makes me feel to watch my son play the game I played and the way he's playing it. I, j I just can't, I can't express to you how that makes me feel. I can tell you. But really, me telling you is not really expressing how I right. feel inside. Yeah, that, and you're right, Rick. It, 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 man, it, it's it's like it's like goosebumps when you're watching them play. It's like goosebumps. I mean, you like and everything that they do, even though you're watching them on TV, you actually sweating like they sweat. You know, you you moving like they moving. You like, oh, you should have got that or make that <laughs> shot. How how you gonna miss that free throw? You know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's how it is. And I try to tell people because my wife was an All American player and didn't you know, work with USA Basketball, and she really knows the game. We both said to us, you know, sometimes wouldn't it just have been nice just to be able to do like maybe other parents there to say, oh, isn't it so great our son is getting the play? The problem is we know the game so well. We right. know everything they do right, everything right. they do wrong, right. and so it's just such a more of an intense experience when you're watching them play. My wife. She has to sit in another room upstairs, and I sit <laughs> in my room downstairs <laughs> because I need, you know, we, me, Rick, and I, we looking at the game totally different than what our wives are looking at it. You know, our wives are looking at it and they screaming at the TV <laughs> and they yelling and I come in and get that and so and so this and that. We 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 trying to be cool, calm, and we like, you know, we but we study in the game, so just in case they call. Just in case they call, we know exactly what they're talking about. We know the play that they're talking about. We know what they should have done, what they should not have done, and so we can be, so we can explain it to them right. Am I right? Well, I'm a little bit different. She, does, she, does, she, my wife is gets so nervous because she knows it so well and, and really understands the game incredibly well that she gets so nervous. In fact, even when we were at games, a lot of times they have shots and he goes to shoot a free throw. She hides her eyes. She can't even. <laughs> <look>. <laughs> It's so nervous. And so I've been through it before, obviously, with the other kids that I have. Right. And this is a different mother than my other boys. And she just has a very difficult time. I mean, sometimes if it's a close game and doing stuff, she's hiding her eyes or has to go out and go for a walk or something. <laughs> a lot of times on TV and stuff, she doesn't even watch it. She's just, no, I can't. I can't. It's just too much for me. Just tell me what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my, my wife, she had turned, she had turned, you know, and, and she had turned the channel and watched something else. And then she had come back. And be like, what happened? We were so. I said, well, you should have kept it on. No, that would have made me mad. Or if she, <laughs> you know, or if it's something that's going on, she'd get up, and you know, it's a crucial play. It's like ten seconds left to go, a minute left to go. She'd get up and start walking around the room and start pacing and looking back and forth at the TV, and and she, that's how nervous she is. So yeah, I mean, they 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 go through a lot. Moms go through a lot because they want to see their kid excel as much as they can. Yeah, Go ahead, I agree Summers, that. I've been dominating the conversation. No, I, I look, I'm just sitting back. This is a pleasure to me. I, I you know, I, and, and Tim, my earliest memories of the Warriors were the sleepy Floyd, Joe Barry Carroll days. Oh. Right. And, and, 
And, uh, and then shortly after that, there was a little downturn, and then you showed up. You got drafted by the team. I think you were 14th overall, um, and your impact was immediate. And, and the moment you got there, Run TMC came. I'll never forget your amazing, I think it was 89, your upset of the second seed Spurs in the first round. You beat him in four games, if, I, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, with Sean Elliott, David Robinson. Um, that, I mean, can you describe to the fan base who still remembers you guys to this day, from your perspective, what it was like to be a part of just that high energy, high entertainment run TMC team? Well, you know, um, I think it was a perfect fit as soon as I got drafted. Um, I was trying to get there to Oakland, but it was a rainstorm in Chicago, so I couldn't get out. And didn't know nothing about Nelly. Just, you know, New Milwaukee days, Boston Celtic days, and coaching and everything. Um, saw Chris Mullen, Mitch Richmond on TV because I was at Texas El Paso out west, and I could watch them on TV. And um, I knew somewhat of them. And um, But, you know, the, when I got drafted there, after the press conference, it was just fitting. I haven't, play, I didn't, I haven't played ball in about, like, four days. And so I was starving to play basketball. And Chris was like, what do you want to do? I was like, man, I'm ready to go Who? They started laughing. They was like, I, I was like, what's wrong? He was like, we ready to go who too. So we went and opened up, well, Chris Mullen and, and Mitch and Rod went and opened up um, Jason Kidd's old high school. And St. We Joe, went, yeah. yeah. St. Joe, we went there and we played like, I guess it was about like two and a half hours. We were just playing basketball. And we was on the same team, and it, it felt like I just knew them. You know, I knew where to throw the ball at uh, right on time, uh, uh, you know, where they liked the ball at. It was, just, it was just a perfect match for all of us. And, you know, I think after my first year, my second year, Nelly walked in and said, hey, Tim Hardaway is the, the, the guy that's running the show. He running the show, and if you're upset with him, you're upset with me because I told him what to do out there on the court. So uh, that's the first thing. And he was like, I was like, Nelly, so you want me to tell Chris Mullen and Mitch Richmond to do what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, talk to them, you know, and make sure that they know that you're the captain, you're the leader of this team. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, how am I going to talk to Chris Mullen? You know, that's Chris Mullen, you know, Mitch Richmond coming off rookie of the year and everything. I had to, you know, get my way into doing that. And like I said, it worked out fine. And, and we, we just went there and just – we just played. We, we knew each other. We understood each other. We had – all three of us had basketball IQs. Then you had Sharunas martial arts. Only thing Sharunas, right. only thing Sharunas needed to do was learn the language. He was learning the language off the fly. But once he found out what we was doing and how we was doing it, he was right with us. You know, you had Rod Higgins. Yes. You, know, you had all those guys, Tom Tober, Jim Peters. You had a lot of guys <laughs> yeah. that, that uh, we, we meshed all together. So it, it, it was a great team. The only thing we needed was a center. If we had, like, a center to block shots yeah. and, or, you know, to clog up the hole and to pass the ball into – because most of the time, myself, Chris Mullen – not well, not Chris, myself or Mitch Richmond, we was posting up. So, I mean, we couldn't go to – couldn't post us up on a regular. If we had a big man that we could post <laughs> up and give him the ball, you know, and, and, and let him work down low and get the big people in foul trouble, you know, that, that's what we was looking for. But we did – we we wasn't there long enough, and I think that we, we, we should have – you know, they should have at least built a team around us for, you know, like at least for five years because we had something going and it, it, it would have worked. And that leads to my next question. You know, one of the darkest days, I mean, look, this Warriors organization has made a lot of colossal mistakes, but one of the darkest days in a Warriors fan base history was, I think it was in 92 when they traded Mitch for Billy Owens, which turned into a disaster. I mean, could you, could you describe your reaction when that first happened? And we, we know now it was a huge mistake, but at the time, what was it like in that locker room? I think the whole city was down. Mm -hmm. you know, I think the whole city, uh, uh, I think, we, we, we didn't receive Billy as well as we should have received him. Um, made him feel at home, made him feel, um, you know, you, you, you're a warriors now and, and that, you know, you family now. Um, I think that, that when Mitch left, 
it, it, it was hard for us. It was really, really, really hard for us because we built that chemistry. And I, and I think that everybody around us, uh, we built that chemistry and we understood what we need to do to win and to go and build another chemistry to bring another guy in, bring two guys in because after him was Latrell Sprewell because we needed another two guard. Right. So, I mean, we had to, you know, go back to the drawing board and figure stuff out. So uh, it, it was tough. And um, like I said, we, we, we really, really, and I think Billy uh, kind of knew that we didn't uh, receive him very well because we was missing one eye guys, but that was our fault. But I think that the fans uh, expectation of Billy was, Hey, you got some big shoes to fill and you got to come with it. But they had, they also didn't understand that he was a rookie. Yeah. You know, he was coming out of, he, he wasn't a four year uh, starter. He was like a two year starter coming out of college and his body wasn't even fully form yet he wasn't even mature yet he was six nine he could play but he wasn't ready for 82 plus games and um so it, it was it was kind of tough on him and and uh but uh you know it, it yeah once once mitch left that was i think that was the beginning to the end of what we was trying to do yeah i know what they were trying to do i was first thing i said what the hell are they doing was my first <laughs> <laughs> we all were we all were no, but here's the thing is because i think they just wanted to get some freaking size yeah, they were so worried about size. Well, hell, they would have been better. Go get a center. I mean, you yeah. didn't need somebody that's a that's a three four, right? You know, right. seriously. I mean, well, you yeah. know what's cr- what's crazy is I think that first year though, you guys still finished as, with the second or third oh, best. Yeah, record. yeah, yeah, yeah. We still was right there. We we yeah. was like uh, what three or four right there. Yeah, yeah, I remember in, that. In, East in a West Conference, so we was right there. But you know, uh, I mean, we still needed you know that you know, that one, two, three punch. And mm-hmm. Billy, I think Billy at that particular time, once we got to the playoffs, Billy was dead tired, dead oh, tired. Yeah. You know, the rookies, you know, it wasn't a rookie slump or anything like that. He was just hitting that wall and that was it, you know, and he, he didn't have no more left in the tank. And he, once it was over with, he needed that vacation bad. You know, uh, it, oh, you go ahead, sir. can you tell, yeah, can you tell people if you would, just how good a player and how smart a player Chris Mullen was. Oh man, oh man. Uh, you know his, his his basketball IQ is is through the roof. I mean, you you're talking about a guy that understands the game inside and out, um, studied the game inside and out, knew his opponent opponents. Uh, Knew who was coming off the bench, knew who was starred, knew how they liked to play him. Uh, but you know what? <clears throat> Chris didn't have athleticism. He said he was a small version of Larry Bird. Oh, no question. No <laughs> question. Slow, but, but, but methodical. Knew quick how to move. Step. Quick first step. Yep, yep, yep. Quick first step. step. Yeah. And, you know, and, and another thing was um, a lot of people didn't know how you know, he wasn't quick or, I mean, he wasn't fast. He right. was just, he was just quick to different spots. And he knew how to maneuver his man around because, you know, if, if you think about it, that's what he had to do at St. John's. He had to move without the ball all the time. And he had to create space to shoot that jump shot. And as soon as he got it, I mean, it, it, he needed one, he just needed a little bit to get that jump shot off. And that's what he did. And a lot of people in the NBA, when you're in the NBA, that floor is big. Is huge. <laughs> so, so back doors. He learned how to go back door. He knew how to put the ball up on the rim. Uh, but his basketball IQ, especially on a lot of people thought that uh, that they could really, really take him uh, off the dribble and, and beat him off the dribble and, and, and out strengthen him. But when they played against him, he was like, "Yo, that's a strong dude," and <laughs> he, he knows how to move his feet, move his hands, and he was always one step ahead of folks. You know, if you thought you was going to get one step ahead of him, he's like, no, no, I'm going to be one or two steps ahead of you. And I love playing with him because his basketball IQ was through the roof. And you know, if it was a shot that needed to be made and he was open, it was going to be made by Chris Mm. Mullen. What a player. He's one of those guys that, you know, you keep – I hear this all the time, and Cyrus and I have talked about it. The extra – oh, he made the extra pass. I'm telling hey, 
if the guy you're passing to isn't as good a shooter as you are, don't pass the damn ball to him. You take the shot. <laughs> That's true. That is true. You mean, we always say, know your person now. Right. Yes. Know your person now. If you don't know your person now, you shouldn't be out on the court. Exactly. Absolutely. So, so how, did you, how did you develop your, your, famous, your famous crossover and the dribble that made, made you kind of famous? And obviously, I'm going to say something about it. I don't take this as a, as a put down or anything. But what you did actually changed the game to the point where I think it's got overdone. And I love what you said <laughs> because I, I read some stuff about some other interviews that you had. And, and, and I need to bring this up because I think you were right on. You did that. But you didn't do it to the extent that players today do it. You did it to get open as fast as you could and make a move as opposed to this dribble, 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 dribble. I mean, you can't make a pass if the ball's in your hand. But if you get by the guy, now you're ready to dish it off to somebody, do something with it. You were productive with your dribble. That's what I loved about what you did. You did it quickly. So explain how you learned how to do it and your philosophy. Well, back in when I was growing up in, in, in grammar school, um, my grammar school coach said, when you dribble the ball and you trying to get past somebody, dribble to get to the rim. Don't dribble to go sideline to sideline. Don't dribble and veer off and go around somebody. Dribble to get past them, have him on your shoulder so you can hold him off. If you're going to make a layup, hold him off so you could pass the ball to the corner. So don't – and don't use uh, – excessive dribbles or use a lot of energy trying to get past your man do what you need to do get past and make a play and and I, that stuck with me all through you know high school because you know when I, I I was I was dribbling one time in in high school and I dribbled and I was just dribbling and going through some doing some stuff against somebody and I came to the bench and the, and the coach was like you tired huh I was like yeah he said that's why we want you to just go straight to the basket when you dribble. And if you shake your man, go to the bat. Don't try to shake him again. I said, yeah, I understand that now. So that stuck with me all through my career. But when I was in college, um, you know, I, I was dribbling ball all over the place. When I was in um, grammar school growing up, uh, I used to dribble to the parks. I used to dribble down the street to go get milk, go get cigarettes for my mom. <laughs> Back then, you had to have a note to go get cigarettes. And, you know, go get pop, whatever I need to go get at the grocery store. I used to dribble the ball up and down. Up and down. I used to dribble with my left hand, dribble with my right hand. I used to uh, uh, go into the parks, three or four of us. The guys, they used to say, all right, we'll give you a dollar for every ball that you can walk. That means dribble between your legs, just walking normal for every block you go. So in every block, you, you, if you mess up one time, then you owe us a dollar. So I used to have to dribble the ball down the street. And then when a car came, I stopped and moved in between the cars and just dribbled between my legs until the cars went by. And then I went and I started again down the street. So I made a lot of money. You know, a dollar, a dollar back then goes a long way. So, I mean, you know, $5, I was good. $5, shit, $5, that was easy. So, I was, I was good. So, that's how I learned how to really, really dribble. And I had to get down and make sure I, you know, you might hit a rock. You had to, you know, make sure you get down and, and, and concentrate and keep that dribble alive. So, um, um, and I, I just kept dribbling, kept dribbling, kept dribbling. And as I, you know, got older, you know, this – when I got to college, the, the, it, it was just a move that I saw Pearl do. Pearl Washington, he came, he crossed somebody off the screen. I said, I can't, first of all, I can't get that low. You know, that was real. He like, he rolled it back. So I said, let me, you know, do something else. I put it between my legs and put it in front of me. And I was like, okay, I might have something here. So in college, we kept playing one-on-one -on -one and, and I had this move where I could go to, but I never thought of it as, you know, kill a crossover until Magic, when he was playing against Magic in the second round, and he was talking about the scouting report. You know, Chris Mullen, you know, that guy's a deaf shooter. You got to get on him. You can't leave him open. We got to be on him. Mitch Richmond, the bulldog, the rock. That's why they call him the rock, because he could post you up. He could take you, you know, take you off the dribble. He could shoot it right in your face. And then he said, you know, Tim Hardaway, man, we got to all be ready, because if we're not ready, he got that killer crossover that, you know, 
take you to the bucket. And if you're not ready for it, he's going to embarrass you. So that's where the killer crossover came in and everybody started calling the killer crossover a UTEP two-step. Yep. But, uh, but, you know, I developed it in college and it, it, it was just a, a move to get me open or to get me to where I need to get to to make a play. And, that, and that, that's all you need. Back then, you know, we was beating each other up. It's not like Rick said earlier, like today, you get any way you want to get. Because if you blow, if you blow somebody, they're going to call a foul. But back then, you had, to, you had to have a move and you had to be strong with it. And you had to be under control with it to get where you need to go to make a play. So I, I, I Cyrus real quickly. Yeah, 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 of course. So, no, because he said something that resonates, resonated with me. So for you people who are listening to, to Tim Hardaway, who is our guest here in Warriors 24, and Rick Barry here at Cyrus Satchez, is that you made a comment that it's so great. And I tell people, you don't have to get by your defender. Timmy earlier said, you just got to get him on your shoulder and you own him. Yeah, I, and I was so happy to hear you say that because I've been telling the people this. You, it's not beating your guy, just getting even with your guy because you own them. Right, right. They can't get back yeah, in front. I love you made your quick move and you did it. And it's like, for me, I didn't do all that dribbling. You know, when I played, they said, oh, man, Rick Barry really handled the ball, you know, the point forward and stuff. Hey, I had a crossover and a, a cr just in front of me, one hand to the other hand, and dribble with my left and right hand. And that was like some big deal for a guy my size. And, but the thing is, when I got the ball on the wing, I did not beat people off the dribble. I had it stationary in my hand, and my first dribble was always a productive dribble and doing exactly what your coach told you to do, going towards the basket. Yeah. It's crazy lateral stuff. Guys come today to me when they run a two-man game and the center comes from the top of the key to me on the wing. I'm, I'm saying, what the hell are you doing? I don't want to go to the top of the key. Get your butt right. down in the post and come set a screen so I get in the gut of the defense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the, yeah. Game, the game has changed a lot. It has. And I remember vividly those Magic Johnson comments because that was the second round after your Spurs upset. And that really put the UTEP two-step and your crossover on the map. And, and to me, and I won't really ask you a question about this, but to me, one of the greatest what-if moments in Warriors history was 94-95 when you had you, Sprewell, Chris Weber was drafted. And then you blew your knee out. And, and yeah. to me, that's always going to be one of those, like, I wonder what this team would have been like. Because even with Avery Johnson, who was no, no disrespect to him, but he's a shell of who you are as a player. And they still made a run. I think they got the sixth uh, seed that year. I mean, how did that break your heart? How did you feel that year? Yeah, you know what? I, I think that hurt the whole chemistry of the team because I wasn't around to try to uh, – help Chris Weber understand Nelly and help Nelly understand mm. Chris Weber. Uh, it was, it was only one voice on that team and that was Don Nelson. You always need a, another voice on the team that kind of can buffer things, you know, both players and or coaches and a player. And um, I wasn't around enough because I was trying to get myself healthy and hundred percent. So, uh, I think that really hurt Chris. And if Chris, if I was there to play with Chris and to make Chris understand exactly what we was trying to do, how he, we was doing it, just like in his later years when he went to Sacramento, that's the way we wanted him to play. That exact way. But he didn't understand that right then and there because he was a rookie coming out. You know, he was the big thing. But you need you needed a strong head, and I was the strong head at that time. If I didn't get hurt, you know, I could have buffered everything and, and had them uh, understand one another, and we would we would have been all right. Probably Chris would have been there for a longer period of time. Oh, yeah, but, uh, I think know, that, 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 that it was it was you know it wasn't only my knee being blown out, but it was it was me uh, not being there to help out the whole situation and the chemistry of the team. Yeah, well, I think what you needed, what they needed to have, and I think this is critical on any team to do it, that's where one of the assistant coaches has to come in and be a buffer between the head coach and some of the players. Because yeah. sometimes, and yeah. you know, a player is better, but if not, an assistant coach has got to assume that role and has yeah. to be able to understand and realize it. Just like it never should have gotten to the point later on when, you know, when you know, Latrell went nuts with PJ and stuff. I mean, that should never, ever happen. That should never happen on a team to get to the point where a player is so upset with a coach that he's going to strangle him. I mean, that's insane. It yeah. really is. I yeah, mean, that so, was. 
That was. That was. That yeah, was right. Clifford Ray. Clifford Ray was the guy on our team. Clifford, hey, Clifford Ray had to be the buffer between me and the rest of the guys on the team. Say, hey, listen, he bites it. He barks like crazy, but he really doesn't bite. Just ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, team, we've had you for a long time. I only have one more question. You know, to me, you two are the most underrated players in this game, this game's history. I mean, ESPN just came out with this ranking of the greatest players ever. And Rick, they put you at 43. That is absurd and blasphemous, in my opinion. And then Tim, my God, you're not in the Hall of Fame. I mean, that, I, I mean, you're an Olympian. You were, I think you were first team NBA one year. You had this long career. You've revolutionized the game. Tim, in your opinion, why are you not in the Hall of Fame? And do you anticipate them eventually calling you and inviting you? Well, you know what? I, I came to this realiz- real- realization that I'm not going to answer that question no more. I oh, sorry, man. I, I, no, 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 you are right. I can't control that situation. So instead of me talking about it, I, I don't talk about things I cannot control. Like the president, we can't control him, so I don't talk about him. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and, and if they do call me, of course, you know, I, I, I'd be happy to go in. But other than that, man, I just, I just live my life. I have fun with my family, and I watch my son play. You know, that, that's the joy of, 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 of basketball for me. And I still love the game. I still love being around the game. And, um, but yeah, I mean, people could ask me that and do I deserve to be in? I think I do. I know I do. I do too. But, I do but, too. But, but I can't control that situation. So I don't, I don't talk about it. First of all, let me compliment you on the fact that you, 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 as you get older, you realize that what is in your brain. My wife has got me to learn to put the filter on what goes into your brain doesn't necessarily have to come out of your mouth. And so having a filter is a good thing. But for those of you who want to know why, I mean, you could read about what happened and I was going to bring it up in Cyrus. That's two times now when I let it go to you, did you ask exactly the same thing? I was <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. No, I apologize for that. No, no, no. It's great. It's great, great minds think alike, but here's the thing is that Thank you. I'm going to tell you, Tim, that I, and I'll say it without saying it, that the reason you thought that you weren't going in, that is not the reason. Having been in the Hall of Fame and doing that and doing being on that's not the reason why. So don't even think that that you know that one moment there had anything to do with your being chosen. There's a lot of factors to go in. There's a lot of guys brought up from the past and doing stuff. You're probably getting to the point where you might you'll probably wind up if you don't get in before, which you should be. And I agree, you should be in there based upon who's in there already. But you'll get to the veterans thing. There is no doubt in my mind that if it doesn't come the, when it should, and, and just look at it, you're, you, you've got a lot of people in your company. Artist Gilmore had to go to the freaking, uh, go to the ABA committee to get into the Hall of Fame. Are you freaking kidding me? Oh, wow. I mean, wow. Artist Gilmore. I mean, this right. guy was a 2020 guy in college. His career was unbelievable. And yes. he had to wait all that time. So, and the best things in life are worth waiting for. No and question. I really believe it'll come for you. But if the worst case scenario is you'll go to one of these other committees where the guys actually know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> the game, because they change these committees all the time. Trust me, I've been on enough of them and you're going to get in there. So just, just take your time. And when it happens, I know it'll be a great, uh, great situation for you. My final question to you, what was it like being you know, a great player and your experience as doing and being an assistant coach? What was that like for you? Man, you know, I'm going to tell you this you're not in control of anything when you're an assistant coach. <laughs> when you're a player, you go out there and you can be in control of the whole situation and you can run and, and do this and play defense and, and see stuff and, 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 and react to stuff. As an assistant coach, you know, you, you have to teach these ball players what you see. You have to uh, make them understand and be prepared about going out there and playing the way you want them to play and how you want them to play. And that's the toughest thing. And if you, you know, have a couple of players, you know, just out here just to have fun and them the couple, them your main players, then you're not going to win, man. You're not going to win. So your main players that you depend on have to buy into it. And, but they got to want to win too. They have to want to win. They have to want to go out there and put in the work and want to win. And, and, you know, like Michael said, he said cut the other day because, he, he, you know, he was crying. He said, if you don't want to put in the work the way I put in the work, then you shouldn't be here, you know. And, and, and I, Rick Berry knows that. Rick Berry been putting that work. Chris Mullen putting the work. You know, we, 
we tried to be there earlier than Chris Mullen just to get on the Stairmaster to work out. No, Chris Mullen was there <laughs> earlier than we thought we could be there early to get on the Stairmaster to get a workout in first. You know, we thought we going to get on court earlier than Chris Mullen. No, Chris Mullen already worked out two times before we wanted to work <laughs> out one time to get on the court. So, you know, that, that's, what, that's what it takes. And that's what you got to try to get the whole team to buy into. But if, you know, you got one or two of your best ball players that isn't buying into that, you, you, you behind the eight ball. So, but everybody got to want to win. You got to love the game and you got to want to win. Yeah. Well, here's the thing I tell you, based upon the thing is, is when you love the game, it's not work. That's the difference. I mean, <laughs> that's, 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 you know what? You, you're right about that. Seriously, it's not work anymore. But you also said something, again, in, in, in reading some of the things that you've said to other people in the past, that when you were coaching, and I really can relate to this, and I bring it up all the time, is that the one thing, the word that you use that's so critical that I think most players don't have the ability to do, which is to stay focused. Yes. You can get them to play hard as a coach because they know if they don't play hard, they're not going to play. But if they're playing harder, they're not focused. You're a half a step late. And if you're a half a step late in basketball, forget it. You're done. Yeah. It's over. And so exactly. you use the word. And so it, it was great because that's something that you can't teach these kids, these no. young kids. You can't teach them what that's about. They no. have to learn that for themselves. It's hard to stay focused. But I, as a coach, I said, look, guys, I'm not asking you to stay focused for 48 minutes. First of all, nobody's hardly anybody other than Will Chamberlain is going to play 48 minutes every game when he played one season more than 48 minutes. I said, so for the time you're out there, if you can just be in, if you played 40 minutes a game, which in today's game is a lot. I mean, back in our day, we played a lot more than that. But if you can stay focused as a team for 48 of 40 of the 48 minutes, you're going to win a lot of basketball games True. because you're going to have an edge over the opponent because most of your opponents in those teams can't do that. Right. You're absolutely right. You 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 right about that. Most most opponents and most guys on that team are not going to be focused 48, 40 minutes. Not 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 48, but 40 minutes. Some of them not even engaged for 30 minutes. Oh no, it's even less than that. I used it, we used to break it down when we played our best game. I showed them. I said, okay, in this game, we were focused for 24 minutes, 26 minutes. I said, look at the scores of these games. It was I said, it's no coincidence that the number of minutes as they increased the margin of victory in the games also increased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Listen, Tim, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to join us here. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. I've always had great respect for your game. And as I say, hang in there. I, I think we'll hopefully get to see you at an induction ceremony at the Hall of Fame uh, in the years to come. Uh, you deserve it. It'll eventually be there for you. But I wish you and your, your family continued success and, and good health and appreciate you taking the time to, to uh, spend this time with us. No problem. Thank you all for having us on. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Cyrus. I appreciate yeah, you all. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, and I grew up watching you, Tim. It's, this was an absolute pleasure for me to watch. See both of you just conversing is enough for me to have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all take care. Be well. You too. See Thanks, you. Tim. Care. All right, everybody. We hope that uh, everybody's doing as well as can be under these crazy circumstances that exist. Looks like we're starting to get a little semblance of normalcy in a lot of places, and hopefully we won't have another major outbreak of this crazy virus, but uh, stay well, follow the rules. I mean, even I, I'm putting on my face mask, going shopping and things and keeping the social distancing. As it's responsible. Possible. It's responsible. Yeah. Responsible, but it's also being smart, especially, mm -hmm. you know, when you're an, an old fart like me, you need to probably do more of that because it's the old farts like us that have more susceptibility, I guess, to this. Although I try to keep myself in pretty good shape. So, Hey, you know, I think you'd, news that hurts, Cyrus, you'd be great, fine. Here's the yeah. great, news. great news is, is that, because of the postponement of the big three, so my coaching thing is not going to happen. And, and and then I got, I mean, the disappointments, the, the cruise I was going to go on, my wife that I was so excited about going on, that's done. Right. Uh, well, the appearances I was supposed to make, those are all done. But then my fishing trip to Alaska, I get the call from the lodge telling me that they can't operate this summer because they're in a near a village in Alaska and they won't give them the permission to do it. Oh. So now my fishing trip is done, but he, he, oh. he said, no, God has a way of working. Everything in life happens for a reason. So what happens? So I call up my friend who owns a couple other lodges that I wanted to you know, trying to go to as well, that they were filled up. And so I, now I go back and I call them up and they said, well, we'll check it out and see, because we've had some cancellations because some people are a little reluctant to maybe travel and all. But he said, we're operating. We're good. We've got our permissions from the state. We got our permissions from where we are in the, in the wilderness. And he called back, Rick, he said, 
we have the exact dates that you were supposed to be going that you wanted to go before and we have it available. And if you have your people and everything, you guys can have the whole lodge. I said, that won't, that doesn't make you crazy. I love it. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. I'm one of the great rivers, the Iliamna river, oh. Iliamna river lodge where I'm going part of uh, of rainbow river lodge. And uh, you know, Chad and, and Bill, the, the two guys who run it, the owners, I mean, and their families are great. So Clifford Ray and I are going with Clifford's old college teammate and another buddy of mine and his son. And uh, so we're, we're going to have an amazing time because so many of the uh-huh. lodges are closed down. The fishermen are done. They, they have great water. They expect this to be some of the greatest runs of, of, of king salmon and sockeye salmon. And so the fishing should be off the charts. This may be one of my great trips in, in all the years I've been going up there. So I'm really excited about that. So something good. Oh, we see it's, things happen in life. You know, you just got to hold on and it'll all work itself out. Yeah. So I hope that's the case for all you people out there. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. We'll see who Cyrus is able to uh, come up with for another guest down the road. <laughs> well, I want to add, Rick, before we wrap things up, A, you know, this, the last dance, I, I've, the one thing I had forgotten until watching this documentary is um, the influence Michael Jordan has on you just from his actions, right? I mean, I'm watching this and all I want to do is work out, move forward, stay positive, strive for greatness, it is amazing how contagious that kind of attitude is, you know, and I almost forgot about that because that's everybody who watched Jordan in those days. That's what you got from him was bust your ass. Hard work pays off, you know, maintain mental toughness, care about things. Passion is a good thing in life. And, and it's just seeing this all over again. I love it, you know, and, and, you know, and, you feel and like when you're talking to this, saying this, that you're preaching to the choir. Oh, I, I know I'm preaching to you, to the choir. I'm talking about just the rest of the no, Rick, you, there are very few people in this world, in my opinion, who exude true greatness, at least in terms of sports and athletics. And, and the mentality that you and Jordan and Kobe had to me were very similar. I mean, you, you went for greatness and you went to win because that's what sports is, right? It's competition. Uh, it's, and anyway, on a side note, if people want to get a message from you, cameo.com, right? Personalized yeah. message. Um, you can follow Rick Barry on social app where not only the video stuff and all, they're going to have some, we have some things where you can do something back and forth and in texting and other stuff. So it's kind of nice. Cool. And you can follow Rick Barry on social media at a Rick 24 Barry. Follow me on Twitter at docs or Frode show and our show on all social media platforms at warriors 24 pod. And I think I'm looking forward to uh, possibly getting on George Carl as our next guest. I hope that happens. So with stay George, tuned. I was with George not too long ago. We get together with this guy with, with big bill and his pizza place up in Denver when George of course was up there and he was there. Doug Moe was there. I mean, a bunch of other ABA nice. guys there, uh, Steve Chubin and other, and we had, a <laughs> nice, you know, hanging out. So George would be great to get George on. Yeah. Um, are you in Colorado now or are you still in Florida? Oh, no, 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 they shut down the Broadmoor hotel where I belong and doing it. They're not even open that up, I think until July. And so we're hoping that they're going to open up things for the members. And so we're, we're planning on going back to the end of this month. Okay. All right. So yeah, you're hot right now. Colorado. You're it's cooking. getting a little hot and humid down here. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm not a big fan of that humidity and uh, <laughs> get myself out of here. But we, you know, our son's down here, Canyon's here, doing yeah. stuff, getting ready to maybe, hopefully. Can you believe this? His, his background check got declined one time. My son's background check. I mean, what? The travel? Yeah, that they had to send out that he was going to drive for Amazon, you know, just to make a few bucks while he's waiting because he's in kind of a flux. You know, no right. money to do it. Like I everyone, mean, yeah. How the heck does, I, how can his, and, and he even said, well, the, the social security was, I said, how can that be? He's, you know, he's got, he does his taxes go through. He's got, it's the dumbest thing ever. It really is. And so yeah. he thought he'd be working now for the last couple of weeks, but now it's, it's just nuts. It just shows you how things go wrong in the world and how stupid and inefficient people can be. Yeah. That is so, weird because he was clear to go to the Olympics, yeah, he but he's not clear to, to work for Amazon. <laughs> yeah, and part of the United States team and go to go overseas and play represent the United States, but he's not clear to drive for Amazon. Weird. That is I, weird. Yeah. And he, he might be just <laughs> so, a little bit overqualified. Oh, th- maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> engineering. Yeah. So, All right, Rick. Always a pleasure, sir. Listen, everybody have, uh, have, you know, just do well under the circumstances. Uh, we'll see when we get back. You know what else I'm going to go get to since we already had, had Timmy on is I'm going to go, I'll call Chris Mullen and see. If we yeah, can get please. He's, he's in the area most of the time. I know he's got a yeah, restaurant yeah, he's and back there now and doing stuff. I think he's doing stuff for the Warriors again. Yeah. He's doing some TV stuff. He owns a restaurant in Danville among probably many investments, but um, yeah, that'd be great. Absolutely. Rick is always a pleasure, sir. Hope you're doing great. Right. Take care, everybody. God bless.